Hi, I'm Ryan Henry with the 4-H Leadership Group here for Clever Clovers. We are working with the LCSWA on their website. I'm actually here with Lee Peterman. So Lee, how did you get into the tree farming? We bought the property in 2013 and it was at that point almost 20 years of benign neglect. And that literally means everything was overgrown. We didn't know what we were doing. We were not tree people. And so I was invited to a meet your neighbor or get to know your neighbor tour through the Small Woodlands Association. And I went on the tour and was so impressed with the people that I met and talked to and the amount of knowledge that was out there that I immediately joined the Small Woodlands Association. And I just opened myself up and said, send the knowledge my way, I'm willing to learn. And I had an incredibly steep learning curve because as a non-tree person coming into an 80 acre former tree farm and woodlot, I had a lot to learn and I had to learn it quick. That's very interesting. I look forward to hearing what you have to teach us today. Okay, so we, let's say you've already cut this tree down, it's mm -hmm. on the woods floor, mm -hmm. just ways out there. How would you get it back here to the mill? Right. So, uh, for both safety and to save one's back, uh, I use the Junior Arch, and this is also by, uh, designed and, and patented by Mark Cavill over in Polk County. And he designed this so that a lot small landowners could use the trees that they're dropping on the ground and then get them either to a mill or for some other project. So the action of this junior mill, or junior mill, the action of this junior arch is simple, what he calls toggling action. And I'll also point out this, we have put the extra extended arm so we can drag longer lengths, but you just back the arch over, drop the little hooks into place, and then pick the log up. Now you can balance it so it's perfectly balanced, or you can just push it along. And the nice thing about it is when you're ready, it's a simple action to just unlock it, slide it over the top, and walk away. And the nice thing about it is this particular log, this is a little cherry log, it probably weighs about 60, 70 pounds, uh, which one could pick up and put on a shoulder and walk it someplace. But if you have the mechanical advantage and the leverage to do it, why be foolish and put it up on your shoulder? Well, that kind of makes this a really valuable piece of equipment. Almost invaluable. In fact, as, as important, I think, as the chainsaw that's used to cut the tree down. Let's see if I could just, yeah, that's a little bit better. And you just walk it, and you can tell I've got just one hand, and I'm just walking it back and forth with one hand. So, pretty easy piece of equipment to use, and really, really important. In fact, many of the trees and logs that I've gotten in, I could never have done it without this. Okay, so we're on to what I think is my favorite part of this whole thing, the sawmill itself. So, uh, you were just tightening the blade, right? I was. Uh, I usually, in between uh, sessions of milling, I like to loosen the tension on the blade so that it doesn't conform to a certain shape. It, it's unlikely because I mill fairly regularly, but it is possible that you get sort of flat spots if they're too long in one place under tension. So I loosen the tension and then just before I start milling, I tighten it back up. And then just basic, I just run the, the wheel around a couple of times to make sure that everything's turning smoothly. And because it's an electric mill, not a gasoline mill, I don't have to worry about filling up oil. I don't have to worry about spark plugs. I don't have to worry about all of that coolant or anything else. I just check to make sure there's no bugs or moths or chipmunks living in there. And if everything looks clear, then I close it back up. Uh, although I will point out one small thing, and that is uh, the clutch system. Uh, if you watch right through here, you'll see that as this turns, the belt turns around this little uh, uh, gear here, not really a gear, it's a pulley, and then it turns around here and then back to the main drive wheel. This one has no belts on it at all. It's just driven by the other side. 
And that works when I pull in the clutch, and you notice that the small pulley moves up, which increases the tension, which then engages that drive, and then this wheel just spins because the blade is tight and away it goes. So I don't have to worry about the acceleration factor with a gas motor yet. I don't have to wait for it to come up to speed. It's basically at speed the moment I depress the clutch. So it's a very elegant yet simple system and it's a lot quieter and a lot less smelly than a gasoline engine. Anyway, this one I cleaned up the other day, tidied up after myself. So I don't have to, I don't show you all the different layers, but when the sawdust builds up, you get these interesting little art pieces in there of all the various colors and stuff you've uh, milled through. Okay, so closing up. Oh, my, my basic cleaning tools. Uh, a paintbrush and a stick so I can get into the small spaces and then the other one is me blowing and then it comes back up in my eye. Okay. So what do you use the wood from here for? Sure. So when the mill, uh, what I do when I mill is I tend to cut with an eye for a project. Mm -hmm. So the other portions of this log, because they're intended to become uh, habitat, artificial habitat, so bat boxes, bluebird boxes, um, I haven't built a bee box yet, but I suppose I could, um, wood duck boxes, things of that nature, <clears throat> I will mill to the project they're going to. So for example, this one is, and I'll just give you a quick demo on the floggers tape. This particular one on the narrow end, or sorry, this is the fat end. So on the fat end, as you can see there, we're just about 12 inches in diameter on the outside. And on the narrow end, I've already measured it. You'll have to take my word for it. It's about 11 inches, 11 and a quarter inches. So we're just about uh, a nice smooth cylinder, which rarely happens. You know, normally you get crook or sway or a bend or all sorts of weird anomalies. This one's pretty straight. Uh, what I do is to try to get it level, I put a little tow board under one end, which brings that 11 inch end up about three quarters of an inch. So it's pretty level now. And when I make my first pass, then this will just be waste to most people. I have other projects to use it for, but I'll take the first pass and it goes into the cradle or crib behind you, which then goes for other projects. So we can talk about those later. Um, this is called, when you take off a, a, a first cut, I call them off cuts. Some people call them flitches. Uh, some people call them just plain waste or quarter rounds, all sorts of different nicknames for them. Um, Again, most people just either buck it up for firewood or ignore it. Uh, I tend to use it for other projects like biodens for the critters out in the woods and things like that, which again, we can talk about later. But back to your question, when I'm milling, I know this is going to go into boards uh, rather than two by fours or six by six or whatever. So when I mill this, I'll be milling in a nice, smooth, clean, hopefully, passes and try to get three quarter, seven eighths inch, what I set my scale to, to get boards, which I can then turn into bluebird boxes, bat boxes, etc., etc., etc. Uh, let me see, what else can I think of real quick? Oh, uh, something I do, and most millers, most sawyers do, uh, I try to clean off the outside of the log because if there's a lot of dirt or gravel, if it's been sitting on that, it'll dull the blade very, very rapidly. Wow. So I try to clean it off as much as I can. I started to scrape it uh, with the um, um, brush hook and I realized it's still a green log so that, that bark is hanging on pretty hard. So instead I just got out my, uh, my uh, broom and I just touched it up real quick with the broom. Hopefully that'll be acceptable. So how big or small can the logs be that you mill? That's a great question. This particular mill can handle anything up to approximately 22 inches across. This is called the throat. So it can handle anything across about 22 inches. And this guide can go in and out depending on the diameter of the tree. And it's simply just lifting up the lever and pulling it out if it's a particularly wide log or pushing it back in and then that narrows the throat. Uh, it can handle uh, the 22 inches across and this particular log deck, uh, when I purchased this system, I got the extra track length, so I can actually go 
from this point, starting right here to there, is just about 16 feet. So I can cut a 16 foot, I think 16 foot two log. Um, I could go longer, but then that would require trying to move the log down, and yeah. it's very complicated, and it almost, it pre usually ends in tears. <laughs> so I try not to do anything longer than 16 feet. And in fact, I have not yet done anything full length. I think the longest I've done so far is about 15 feet. Um, I have had larger logs on the mill than this. I had a neighbor uh, just to the west of me gave me a dead, uh, about the two-thirds section up on a dead grand fir, and it was 17 inches on the skinny end and 19 inches on the fat mm. end. And I can show you some of the boards for those. Uh, they've thoroughly dried by now. That was the largest log so far. But this is a little bit larger than the typical. The typical are much more 7, 8 inch, 9 inch diameter. If I go too small, the the dogs which lock the, the log into place uh, can't get a good bite and the blade can be wobble up and down. I might catch these and cut them. So I try not to go too much smaller than about eight inches. Um, I can, but it just gets, I wouldn't say dangerous. It's not <laughs> dangerous. It's just, is it worth the effort on too small a log? That's, that's really the catch. This one is very comfortable as far as length. Uh, the catch is with all logs, everybody that wants logs milled, neighbors or, or friends or people from Oslo, as I say, it's not the length, it's the weight. Because I don't have a hydraulic system to get it up onto the log deck so and I I set this up so that we didn't have to go through all the tedious of trying to get it up there what I do is I use the junior arch I bring the logs in on this side I lay them down or I'll hook one end up in on the deck and I'll use this little two by four waste two by four along here and that prevents the log from rolling back off the deck which has has happened but usually what I do is I'll lay it down and I'll use a uh, four by six or a four by four here and I'll use my cant hooks and I'll can't roll the thing up into place and it's not a brute strength it's using leverage and things but it's just very tedious and it takes 15 yeah. or 20 minutes to try to get the thing up there so that's the other reason I don't mill really large logs because I don't have hydraulics to move them so it's again Armstrong method so our final question I guess before we start this thing sure up. So this kind of seems high. How do you adjust it for a different log? Okay. So what I usually do is I have either this or a tape, a carpenter's tape measure, and I'll measure the top or the bottom of the log and get an idea of where I want to start the first cut. And then, and you're welcome to come around here if you wish, the mill itself has a graduated scale. Just lay this cord out. And the graduated scale works in, here's the scale. This is a true inch scale on the outside edge, if you want to focus in on that. And then if you can see the numbers up here, I'm trying to give you some clearance. So here's three quarter, four quarter, five quarter, six quarter, etc. And that what that means is three quarter means three quarters of an inch. So if every time I hit that mark, I've dropped it three quarters of an inch plus the width of the cut of the blade. It's called a kerf. So if I want to drop it one inch, I could either go to the one inch scale, but if I want to compensate for the kerf on future cuts, then I'm going to follow down on the one inch scale, which will add in that eighth inch. So that was one of the hardest things I had to learn to get used to this. Because when I first ran the first probably two dozen logs through, I kept following the inch scale and I wasn't really coming up with clean, neat one inch cuts. I kept losing about an eighth to three sixteenths mm -hmm. every single time. And so finally the light bulb went off and I thought, you know, that's why they put the graduated scales on there. So it took me a while, but I finally came around and learned what I should have learned right off. So again, this just tells me which scale to follow. So if I want something one inch, I'll either follow the one inch scale or start it off at one inch. Mm -hmm. Although that, that doesn't make much sense because that would start the blade at the very bottom of the deck. So that's not the best way to go. 
But you get the idea of using the graduated scale tells you which, mm -hmm. which to do. And then to physically adjust it, and I'll slide in front of you, it's just a simple mechanism of up or, and then I usually, for safety's sake, push a little bail lock in, but to unwind or lower the blade, you simply just lower the blade to where you want to start. And I already know that that's about 11 inches. So what I'll do is I'll adjust this to the nearest three quarters mark to 11 inches. And as you can see, I'm at 11 and about a quarter because that's the compensation it requires to cut the first pass with the blade cut. So if you wanna focus in, you'll see that I'm actually a little bit high, but I know that I'm 11 inches there and I'm about 12 inches on the other end. So I'll take a little mm -hmm. skim off if that's the first cut I wanna do. On this particular log, what I'll do is I'll actually lower it back down to 10 and just, just slightly off 10 and a half. And that will be the first cut. So I'll lower it down, snug it back up. Let me see here. About so. And then that will be my first cut. And you can see where the blade sits at the end of the log. And that will come off. It'll be skinny at this end and a little fatter and wider at that end. And that's how I adjust it up and down. And then when I make my subsequent cuts, I'll just keep following the three quarter inch scale or I'll calculate it back out up here, which I'm not always correct on. I'll go to the one inch scale and I'll just create the curved boards. Um. Okay. That kind of makes sense. Okay. I'll point out a couple of questions, uh, things while we're here. So again, uh, not a gasoline motor on and off are just two simple switches. Everything's wired. It's 220. It runs through the heavy cable to the back of the shop. I had an electrician come out. He put in the receptacle and he hooked up the cable to the back of the mill. I didn't have to do anything professionally done. Cost a couple hundred dollars. Now I'm perfectly willing to pay for that for a professional certified electrician to come out and do the job. Um, I just compare it all the time to gasoline motored uh, equipment like this is there's no pull start, there's no battery, there's no spark plugs, there's no gasoline or oil or any of that. The basic maintenance is a little bit of grease every now and then on the two main bearing wheels, and that's pretty much it. There's not really much maintenance to this. Uh, this is a water receptacle, so if I'm cutting a very old or dry log, I can turn on the water by using this, and that just provides a little lubrication for the blade so it doesn't get too hot. This particular log is still fairly green. I don't think I'll need any lube for it, but it's possible and we'll know after we make the first cut. Uh, and then earlier, when you were asking about tightening up the blade, mm -hmm. that's the mechanism that's right here. And Timbery, the name of the company that uh, built the mill and sent it out to me, provides the actual ratchet to come along with it. And so you just put it in place and tighten down the blade. And there's a little right here there's a little flat plate and you know it's tight when you can run your finger back and forth and there's almost perfectly even. there's probably a foot pounds of torque that it should go to mm -hmm. but they just say run it so that you can feel your fingertip use your fingertip and feel that it's fairly flush so that's the back of the mill uh, the front of the mill is where all the work happens so whenever you're ready we can do a demo on that And we're going to keep this close because I'm going to trim off these outside edges. But here you go. Oh, yeah, that's nice. No rot. That's good. 
It wasn't on the ground long enough for the bugs to get at it. There you go. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Okay, so next step. We're going to go back. I know I should have probably done this just to make sure that I wasn't losing anything on my cup. I could visually... Loosen up the dogs. So a quick question while you work. So sure. How long does it take to kind of season these boards and how do you do that? Okay. What I'll do with the one that's on the ground at your feet and the next one or those subsequent ones that I take off is once they're cut to the width that I want, usually by taking off the, uh, the bark, or you could leave the bark on for a live edge effect if you wish, um, I either move them over to my greenhouse, which we can film in a few minutes, or I stack in the open. Uh, these have very little danger of warping because of their size. I suppose they could, but I haven't had too many problems with that. But with the boards, they can and do warp pretty easily. So they usually go into the greenhouse, which is still air but warm. And then every now and then the air will move through as it warms up from one end to the other. So it's a nice constant or relatively constant temperature. Uh, of course, on a, on a sunny day, and then it can get quite warm in there. Okay, so for smaller logs, I would roll this by hand, but as this one still probably weighs probably close to 300 pounds as it is, I'm going to put a stop on this side so that we can't lose it, and then I'll use the cant hook to roll this over. So I'm just making sure I got nothing in the way, nothing's in the way, and my little kit, oh, thank you so much, appreciate it. I've got the bigger one here, but this is just more convenient. And it doesn't require much for a log stop to keep the log from rolling. A little wedge like that is really handy to keep it from trying to roll over and break my legs. Which, not, not that I would brag about it much, but it could certainly happen. And then I'm going to roll it against the log stops because they have an angled top so it should allow the log to roll against it. Okay? And if you hear a thud and a scream, you can cut. Okay. So, some people, some millers and sawyers, will turn it 90 degrees, and then they'll take off this upper edge. Okay. Uh, I'm going for boards, so I don't really need to do that now. It's kind of an extra step I don't need to do. So, I'm going to go ahead and push the wedge back against that to hold it. I'm going to roll it one more time, and if I do this right, all the little boards and wedges and everything should all fall away. And it looks like I did it right. Hey, I'm glad you got that documented, because it doesn't always work. Okay. And again, I can use the... I have several, several little tools here. This is just a broken shovel handle, or a broken tool handle. So I can just use this to lever the log in a place, but because rolling it against the stops means that I'm using it as a, as a brace, it generally falls pretty square right down into place. I don't usually have to do too much work to get it to level up. Now, again, I'm going to double check my height here, and this is just about six inches, so safety first as I trip and fall. Pull this back just a little bit, and I'm going to exchange this tall stop for the slightly shorter one. And this will make certain that I cannot get my saw blade down there and cut the top of this thing off. So as you can see, it's resting square on the bunk. Hopefully there's no bark under there, then I don't see any daylight. So that's good. It's resting up against the stops on both ends. And I have enough here to put the dog in on this end. And it doesn't require a lot of tension. It's just enough to hold it from vibrating, really. And then the same. on this end. And I usually give it a couple of kicks just to make sure it's nice and set. Now we'll double check, make sure 
So yeah, that's four and a half. And that's four and a half. So now the stops are set to the same height, so I will not run over them, at least for a couple of hours. Okay, this was set at nine and a half, so I'm going to go down to the next three quarter. You can you can cut. Go ahead. You can do technical stuff. I'm just. Oh no! I was telling him not to move. <laughs> oh, I'm just yammering. I mean, you can edit all of this stuff out. Okay, so we got it set up. Okay, and that's going to be a very thin cut here. And it's going to probably now. Oh, that's one thing I should point out. So I had the tow board there originally, and the tow board made the skinny end the same height to the blade as the fat end. Now the tow board is gone, so now it's resting on the level cut. So what you take away from one cut, you gain on the other, but what you gain on one cut, you take away from the other. So I took a little bit extra away. You saw the size of the flitch that I cut away. So now we're level. So this one's going to be a little bit oddly shaped. So you'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Plus, I'm also doing this very carefully, and normally I'd be going a little faster. Okay, be ready. <laughs> barely took anything. It didn't, it didn't even get to the wood. It just got bark. So what we'll do, actually, I'll sneak past you. I know that's a terrible thing. I shouldn't do that. Get it out of the way. So when we get a couple more boards peeled off of here, what we would do is take them, stack them up against the outside, and then run the saw blade down, which would cut nice square edges for boards. Or again, you could leave them what's called live edge, which is, and it's a little bit too far to reach across, but you get the idea. It's just the board with the bark still on it. Thank you. Appreciate that. So that's a live edge. And you would take the bark off eventually, or it'd fall off, and you'd get a sort of a rounded effect. You can make tabletops or bars or bar tops, things like that. It's, and it's very pretty. Um, and it just depends on the project that you're working on. Okay. And if you want to, we can quick go over there and you can see some of the, the milled stuff. Yeah. Okay. 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 So here we are at the end of this woods journey, at least for now. So we, I've had a lot of fun today, but I also noticed a lot of the sawdust. Uh, what do you do with this? <laughs> well, milling wood generates a lot of waste, uh, sawdust and off cuts and things like that, that need to be uh, used up. The sawdust in these uh, dog food bags uh, will probably go for enhancing some garden soil. Um, it could be used as mulch. It could be used to uh, line or uh, pour on a path to keep the path open and so forth. Um, it just depends on whatever project is coming up. If uh, someone in the neighborhood needs some for some soil enhancements or whatever, I give it away. I'm not worried about making a few pennies on sawdust. I'm going to generate lots and lots more uh, but as you said this is the end of the journey for these particular logs uh, the one that's immediately in front of you was from the butt end of the log that we were milling and the one right in front of me or just this side of, of that larger uh, two by eight is uh, the remains of or the last cut of the log that was on the mill during the tour which you got some footage of but this just gives you an example these are ready for uh, a couple of weeks of drying in here in the greenhouse and they'll be ready to turn into bat boxes or bird boxes or whatever project comes to hand. Mostly these are going to be for critters. Uh, the 2x8, and that's a true dimension 2x8, actually it's a little bit bigger, uh, will probably end up being used in some form of a shed or some structure I'll use to keep some of my tools in. It's, obviously it's rather messy in here. And the same with the 2x6. It'll probably just get used, but it could be trimmed a little smaller and, and used up for other, other projects. Uh, this is all very interesting. Thank you. If you viewers are interested in learning more about Bogwood Farm, 
check out our other video touring Bogwood. And I guess we'll see you next time. My pleasure.